All right, you ready to record? Okay. Welcome, everybody, to DPRG's Robot Builders Night Virtual for the 14th of May, 1924. Okay. Uh, just a few things. Uh, next Next big event is May 25th, where we're going to have a Roborama practice at the Dallas Makerspace. And uh, then after that, on June 1st, um, we're going to have the Roborama also at the Makerspace. Um, details can be found at uh, dprg.org slash competition slash Roborama 2024. Okay, uh, the, after Roborama, the next big event is on June 22nd, which is going to be a presentation by Bob Cook, which I think all of us have spent some time looking at his videos for his last Robo Magellan run. Uh, so he's going to talk about AI training for cone finding. Should be very, very good. All right, and then later on in July, we're going to have Scott Gibson. All right, now um, I'm going to stop sharing. To this guy. All right. Oh, man. Uh, okay, so the queue is John, Kareem, and then myself. And uh, so we're going to start off with John. Uh, John, I'm going to pin you. All right. Yeah. And everybody else should probably pin as well. If you want to see this, pin my video. Um, going to do a little quick uh, demo of Roz, my quad walker, doing my first crack at a quick trip uh, run. So uh, you can see the robot is right here. So I'm going to start that. I'm going to move my camera here. <clears throat> so out in this room, you can see there's an orange piece of tape there, and there's another one way down there. And those are basically at the spots, the centers of the uh, where these things would be. Uh, sorry for that. Hard to hold all the stuff at once. So I'm going to put Roz down, sitting on top of that one, pointing at this one. I've got my um, smartwatch running here, my URC. I think I'm going to stand up here so you can get a better view. Um, and I'm just going to hit go. And so it's basically just going to walk down. <coughs> the hall there, the room, towards that other piece of tape. Seems to be off to the side. I'm just pointing it manually right now. So Is that carpet? Yes. Yeah. Gets over to there, turns around. Oh boy, that's pretty terrible. Okay, never mind. <laughs> no star. Oh, I'm gonna stop it. Yeah. It did a lot better than that when I practiced uh Yeah earlier that's still looks like you got a computer there yeah okay. yeah I'm, I'm pretty happy with it Over in crowd, but, uh, having this little uh the urc to be able to to pause it from where i'm standing is really cool yeah Let's see if I can get it working a little better and maybe do another demo later. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah last IMU time. available? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's using, a, it's got a nine axis IMU in the head. That's how it's, it's actually using heading and um, basically the gate to uh, figure out how far it's gone and in what direction. So basically it takes an initial heading reading when it starts and then it projects a point out uh, about 15 feet, which would be about the center of the uh, where, where the end zone is. 
and then it walks towards that and it continually it, the odometry is based on on the gait and the inverse kinematics and um the the, the heading from the nine axis imu so it's basically giving me a an xy position in the world and uh, so it walks towards the end zone and then it gets to the end zone it stops for a second it rotates 180 degrees so that's pointing back at the start zone again and then walks back again and obviously the IME got a little messed up there from something uh, when it was running but that's the idea yeah well, that's pretty cool john uh like i say it looks like you got a contender we still got three weeks so uh, yeah. No question. No question yeah. That, uh, you can work out the bugs and that. That's about two hours worth of work on the quick trip finance yeah. thing machine. Yeah. So, uh, Kareem, I'm going to push you back, and the reason is because I'm kind of doing the same thing John just did, but mine's probably not as as advanced, and so I'm going to go go next. Okay, and just stay on theme. That's great. Okay, and I, I kind of uh, like to wait until. Paul gets back on any, anyhow. That sounds good. Um, so anyway, the uh, okay, all right. But so uh, I'm going to sh to uh, uh, let me get, let me uh, pick up some stuff here. Okay, I'm going to just, they're going to start off, uh, I'm going to share my screen here, if I can. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to show, this this is my uh, my little hexapod that I'm, I'm using, and all I'm trying to do here is show it working on a hard hard surface. Uh, I've got three challenges that I've got to overcome, but you can see this guy, you know. The little lay, um, the, the wood panels to see kind of how he's kind of going straight, but he's not really going straight. And... Uh, so this is going to be, but he's moving forward. So the challenge here is, um, is I believe, to add an IMU. And, okay, I think that's where I have him stop. He stops up here somewhere. Yeah. So I just wanted to see, how, yeah, he can go forward in a reasonably straight line. And then the next question, the thing I wanted to do um, was show... A, that it can also, he has the ability to turn around. He can do this in either direction. Okay, so those are the, the two, two uh, little demos. I, he'll keep repeating that if I don't shut him off there. Uh, so I can go forward and I can turn. And so those are good. That's, that's good. So now I have two, two, two cha three challenges. Uh, I have a, 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 I made a PC board. It's somewhere on the way from China, and it has organizes the electronics and also adds an IM, IMU to to it, and it fits right inside the upper circle. So when that comes in, I'm going. We'll be able to advance this to the next stage. My intent is to, so I don't, so I, I think I can use the IMU, the gyro part, to pretty much stay in a straight line or to turn 180 degrees. I don't think I want to try to go backwards. I think that would be maybe next year, but not this year. So, so the next thing that I have is, is, um, how do how do I know how far I went? Well, I can do a timed move, and but because this guy's little feet don't have much traction at all, I've got to probably make some rubber booties to go over on the time the, the the tips of the of the legs, 
And also, I'm thinking of using a uh, Bantywake uh, TF Mini and having it pointed at the opposite wall. The, the, that particular LiDAR sensor has a range of 30, 30 meters. Is that right? Maybe it's only 12, 12 meters, I'm sorry, 30, 36 feet. So in the room, it should be able to pick the furthest wall. And uh, then my hope is, is that it will run, walk towards the, towards the wall. And uh, when it gets the right distance, it'll stop, do its turn, gauge the next wall, and walk to it. And so that's what I'm planning on doing right now. Um, so it'll either be if if everything works out with the IMU and it can it can step well, then I'm then I'm not going to use the Benny weight. But if I if the if I get finished and I can't guarantee the the stride length, then I'm going to have to use something to to be able to pick up the distance, and that's probably the way I'll at least attempt. That's kind of a weakness. We'll see how it goes. You know, it might be I have three type tries at it, and I, out of the three, I get finally get one that gets some points. We'll see. Uh, that's what practice is for, I guess. So that's all I had to show. And uh, uh, if you were to drag a mouse on the ground behind you, would that consider, be considered a wheel? No, but I, I think old, I'm not sure. old well, school that, ball yeah, mouse, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that uh, what do they call it when it looks down? Uh, the same technology. What do they call optical it? flow? Yeah, optical flow. Yeah. Uh, that would be a potential solution, uh, but I'm not going to have that by June, and uh, so that's not uh, like I say. I'll, we'll see. You know, at the worst, I'll just time it and we'll see how it goes. I just got to make sure. There's two things I've found. One, that it on a slick floor, it'll slip a little bit. Okay. And then on, I also found that it doesn't like crevices. So a really, you know, I'm not talking about uneven. Uneven's not so bad. But if it's got a something that where the little tiny leg can drop down into and... Uh, Get stuck, and I just throw. That just throws it. You know, it, it literally. You know, that one leg won't won't move. Now I do have another gate, a high stepping gate, that I can use. So that's another potential. So we'll see. But the next the next big hurdle for me is to get the board in and get it installed and see how that works. So that's what I'm really trying on now. On. So. Yeah. Maybe give me, I might even put an entry into the six can if I get a chance. I don't know yet. Uh, so that's where I am. All right. So I'm, I'm uh, ready to do this demo again. <laughs> oh, okay. I just ran it again and it ran perfectly. So uh, well, huh, well, that's called demo well, effect. Now. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is going to take a, uh, whoops. This is going to take a second because it's got to start up um, my program. So it's, I think the problem was it wasn't sitting in place when it started and uh, it needs to be sitting in place when it starts. Yeah. So it takes it a minute to, to load up Smalltalk and get it running. Um, so it'll stand up once it's ready to go. So there. So now I get my thing running here and so see a little better going down there to the orange thing and it's gonna stop Let's turn around and and start walking back, and it's still not perfect. It's better than it was. Oh, damn. Uh, it's going to hit. Yeah. Why is it that every time? I guess I better record it using my phone. Hey, uh, I got an idea. Uh, 
John, it might might be happening to you. I assume you've got the the 180 degrees guard banded by some amount, correct? Yeah, basically it 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 starts turning quickly and then it slows down as it gets closer to the, it slows down the turn rate as it gets closer to where it's supposed to be until it's turning really slowly. Um, so. so it's proportional. Yeah, but what is your but, but what is your what is your guard your guard band? Oh, it, it's ten degrees. But I mean, okay, it, it, right, it okay. updates. The, the what? issue is is that it, it updates its direction as it's going to point in the heading. So I, I suspect there's something. It seems to be going off to the right a little bit, and there might be something over there that's metal that's yeah, messing I, it up. I got a few things to think of though. Yeah. All right. There's two te two. I've seen two strategies used. One which would be similar. You'd get similar results to what you saw. And that is as soon as it, you've got a 10, 10 degree guard band around your, your target. And as soon as you cross that 10 degrees, so let's say you're nine degrees, it thinks it's good. So that means you're really, otherwise, whatever steps inside your guard band is going to go that way. Now, the other, the better way to do it is as it's, as it moves, is if it's worse than the previous one, it, uh, I mean, excuse me, if it's better than the previous one, it keeps going. So yeah. as long as the number keeps decreasing and it's only when it increases again that you stop and pick that one. So that's one, sure. one technique that uh, might, be, might be hitting you on that turn. And then the other yeah. one is, might be the granularity of your turn. Um, I mean, you saw mine go around in a circle. Well, there is a certain granularity to that because of the stride. Yeah. Well, I'm changing that as, as dynamically as it goes. Oh, okay. So I'll show you a little, uh, let's see. I'm going to pick, well, here, let me, let me start the, the video here. Let Are you outputting the, the heading error to your URC? Uh, I'm outputting the heading. I'm logging, the I'm logging the difference. In, in the air and stuff. Um, yeah, let me get that back. All right, share window this guy, and hopefully this is a direct video, so this will, um, so. So you're not doing you guys, full PID on the heading right now? No, not right now. So this is, this is uh, Roz just turning on the spot. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty terrible. That, that's okay. Um, yeah, it looks like thirty right degrees back. per stride there. Yeah, it's 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 actually closer to forty. Yeah. Um, it's uh, so it, it it's basically getting about. I, I I loaded it into my video editor. It's getting about eighty-five degrees a second rotation rate at that, yeah. which is. It's within one percent of what the inverse kinematic says it should be, so I'm mm -hmm. pretty happy about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I've still got lots of work to do on this thing. So it, well, it's, it's, it's you've made a lot of progress, John. I mean, that I mean, I, I wish I were where you were. So, <laughs> well, well, you have to realize, you know, I've been working on Roz for 15 years, on and off. This is not a new robot. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. still, still impressive. Uh, there was a point that you made, Kareem, that I thought was was well worth mentioning again. What was the last point you made? Do you remember? Uh, I was talking about whether or not he was doing full PID on heading during the entire yeah. transit. Yeah, no, but you made, you made you made a statement before that. Though. Oh, logging the error. Oh, logging the error, oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. heading error to his uh, yeah. chick magnet. Yeah, yeah I want to I, I say that that would be more important than, almost than heading. Yeah, I, I'm right now I'm logging that to the log, um, which, you know, I can tail on, on, a, on a, you know, another Linux uh, yeah. terminal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just saying but that. That would that tell you immediately if you're... Uh, if your heading is actually, it, like, if the robot's actually tracking heading properly and it's just the heading that's wrong, yeah. it would be very clear uh, from that 
you know, you'd have a very low value, but you'd still see it careening off. And uh, if you're actually doing nine DOF, then it could be some magnetic anomaly or something like that. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, I think it's definitely some magnetic anomaly that's hitting it because it seems to hit it sometimes and not other times. Um, <laughs> I never do magnetic. Uh, um, in, I, I never include magnetic in uh, uh, in heading calculations when I'm indoors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm well, we're going to be yeah. when we're running the competition. We're going to be running this outdoors on Tom or yeah, Tom's driveway. So, oh, just remember, he's going to have reinforcement in his con concrete. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's and, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to have two modes basically where I can run this. I can run it using the IMU, or I can run it just using straight um, inverse kinematic odometry. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm I'm going to have a configurable toggle basically on that, so that I can choose that. Because if I find out when I get there that yeah, the IMU is going nuts, then you know I want it still to be able to do the best that it can um in yeah. rotating yeah i think what kareem and i are, are suggesting is that we think that six degrees is the better way to go on this contest mm -hmm. just just yeah from what i've yeah. noticed and that, what kareem's experience has been too that could very well be because i mean this is only you know 45 seconds for for Roz to basically go up to the end, turn around, and come back again. Yeah. Um, I don't know how competitive that is with. Uh, Th hey, this is the first time this contest has been yeah. run. So anything that make anything that gets points, we haven't. Yeah. Let me put it this way: nobody has made a perfect score in this contest yet. Yeah. So anything you do is, yeah. is good. Now. Yeah. I do think you have to make one point to be able to qualify for, if I remember the rules, one point to make a prize, but that's it. Yeah. I can't remember, don't even remember what that yeah, is. Yeah, and it's really more about the points than, than the time. I mean, it only becomes a time issue if you, if you score equal points with somebody else. Uh, in the wheeled contest, in the wheel contest, time becomes the is the yeah. determinant. There'll be a lot, a lot of robots that are get a nine, or whatever the perfect score value is. Yeah. Be, you know, so their speed becomes. What do they tend to run in the wheeled robots time wise? You can look on uh, dprg.org slash competition slash hall of fame. And there, you'll have to slide down because and see what it says. You have to go to I last year's Roborama. Yeah, I, I want to say Carl really tore it up last year. That's right. For the quick trip? Yeah. I think Jimbot won in 12 seconds. Oh, well, the Jimbot? <clears throat> nice. Or around 12 seconds, somewhere 12 yeah, seconds. Somebody else beat it. Oh, okay. I did I did the mechanic pirouette, and oh, I did the uh, I did the club robots that just went straight and backed up without turning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that one. Who's Jimbot? That's mine. That's my little. Uh, oh, okay. So the Jimbot tore it up. Okay. But anyway, you can the the results are out there in the Hall of Fame of everything that we know. Currently, I've been naming my robots after. Uh, Whoever on my channel asked for them to be built or put in some of the inspiration or okay. whatever. That's how they get named. Okay, gotcha. All right. So so they can be pretty quick. Uh, and we we definitely have as if you turn, you're not competitive anymore in the wheel yeah. wheeled stuff. You just don't have the time. Yeah, so Mike Will Williamson got third place with 21, almost 22 seconds. Yeah. Second place is 18, and first place was just under 13. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, you go the previous year, you might even, I'm not sure. I think that's when Carl was really in it uh, with his, with the club robot. I think that one was, I know it was really fast, but I don't know if it beat Jim Bot. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. I think it barely scored just by luck. One of those last minute on the day kind of hack it and see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is, and this is a dead simple robot too. It's not we don't it doesn't do anything special, doesn't really have any sensors. It can it can count time. And yeah. its wheels don't don't even run straight. So yeah, I'm, it's got real lucky. Yeah, I'm real interested. Uh Scott's gonna be running and he generally is very competitive, so it'll be an interesting competition. I have I have no doubt that because he didn't win last year, he's probably upped his game a bit. That's just kind of right. We'll see. Well I have no doubt about that. Yeah. The thing about Scott, though, is if you do beat him, he almost always has, for whatever configuration he's using, he has the speed optimized. So if you beat him, he can't come back in the next run and, like, cut time by 20% because he usually he's running his motors pretty close to all they can do. So it's, it'll be interesting. It's always fun. Our experience has been that when we introduce a new a new contest, the first couple of times it, it does, you know, they just people kind of feeling it out. Then it starts to get really, really competitive. You know. So, all right. I see Paul. Is that Paul? I thought I saw Paul here. He's is back. He, is he back? Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm here, Doug. Okay. Kareem, you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah. So I wanted to, uh, well, I'll update on the on the robot first. So I'm working on this uh, Pioneer 3 AT robot and uh, um, deeply mired in the process of migrating to ROS2, uh, to, yeah, ROS2. Um, and uh, um, got it to compile last night for the first time still still doesn't run or at least most the the most the the biggest the primary node still doesn't run crashes immediately but uh uh you know it took took a almost two weeks to get it to just do the to just uh do all of the uh grunt work on um migrating the code so uh and that's assuming you know so i'm probably halfway there i'm hoping maybe that's a naive hope but you know the the actual runtime debugging is still a uh in raws too is complete something's still completely new to me so you know we'll, we'll see how it goes but making some progress um i did get the uh, teleop node to be to, to run uh and uh and now i'm trying to configure figure out how to um uh, get that to run over the network as well. So, um, the main thing I wanted to bring up tonight was the uh, the the an outreach event. So, um, every late July, the Frontiers of Flight Museum at the um, uh, at Love Field celebrates Moon Day, which is the anniversary of the first moon landing, and uh, it's an event that we have been to many times. By we, I mean both DPRG and Iron Rain. Um, last year, Iron Rain went there, and we had a full FTC field, as well as like four tables teaching Lego Sumo robots, and so we had a big layout there. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to see if the if the Dallas locals wanted to um, spin up DPRG again. Um, you've you've attended many times in the past, and I just wanted to put that out there. The uh, deadline for registration is the end of May, May 30th. Not seeing a huge rush of interest there. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I'll leave it this way. Uh, I loved Moon Day. I always thought it was, of all the ones we did, I thought it was one of the best ones. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, you know, if we had, I, I'm going to be out of town from mid June to mid mid July, so I, I can't be in front of prep or anything. 
-hmm. but you know it'd be cool to dust off robbie get him running and and have some some different uh 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 displays going uh i'd be you know what day is it again do you know the 20th the 20th july 20th 20th. 10 a.m to 4 p.m and there's a there's a um, recent donation to uh, DPRG that might be interesting to um, as a as a potential exhibit. Um, yeah. Is that DJ, DJI um, rover thing mm-hmm. that um, Mark Reynolds brought um, to the club, um, or the DMS donated to D- DPRG is what I understand happened. Um, I, I'll, I'll be out of town. I'm, go, I'm going off for three months from about June 4th to sometime in September. So I, I, I'd love to see us do it, but I, I just absolutely will not be here. And um, my time before then is limited, but um, if something needs doing, like getting that robot together and figuring out how to put it together and make it do something that someone could potentially exhibit, I could do that. Um, but it's going to take someone local, I think, to uh, be the champion. Be the champion. Yeah. Carl, what's your schedule? I know you're out too a lot of this. Yeah, I'm. Um, you said the 20th. That's like middle of the week, isn't it? Oh, no. That's, no, 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 no. No, Saturday, July 20th. July. Look at the month of July. Uh, I. Uh, oh well, I'm. I'm. Uh, in the office from the tenth through the eighteenth. Eighteenth, yeah. So I, I will be just barely back in town. It's. I, I'm really hurting this year. I probably am not in a good position to be helpful on it. Yeah. Uh, well, it would be cool. You know, I, I know Ray has participated, but I also know that uh, Ron Grant has participated. And um, and uh, Eric has participated. Uh, and Eric likes those things. Eric Cheney. Yeah. And he's into, he's really into it, but he would need to have some help. You know, some people who would say that they'd volunteer to be there. I mean, at this time, I could probably on the twentieth, I could probably be there. I could bring a couple of robots exhibits. You know, we usually do a couple of ones is, uh, what was that, that we, you know, is uh, usually have a LIDAR experiment going so they can see that. Uh, they like, uh, if you can have a, a tracking camera, you know, where they can hold a ball and it tracks, they love that sort of stuff. Uh, we have a, micro, a Microsoft Connect. We can set that up on a monitor. And you can have the dancing, the dancing video, and where it shows where your hands and legs and stuff are, and, and that's a real draw for the kids. Uh, it's not cutting edge, you know, edge technology, but for a, for the demo, it's pretty flashy. Uh, and Ray often set up a little uh, a, a little box with his robot doing can retrieval, like taking it from point A to point B, back and forth. So there's a lot of stuff that can be pretty much pushed together that we've done in the past. I don't know about how much new stuff we could do. And I don't know, you know, if if you've got a full FTC thing going going on, I don't know if we're bringing more to it or just bringing some, some variety to it. Uh, it'd be interesting. Uh, if we can find a champion, like I said, I think I could, I could come. Um, it would be cool to. One thing would be cool to just get Robbie put together so people could see him, even if he's static. You know what I mean? I would, I would love to see Robbie put put together, and and maybe we could find an evening to go into the DMS, and I'm not sure what it takes to put him together, but that'd be really fun. Yeah, right now, probably just making sure all the parts are there. Uh, did Ron, did I hear that Ron was tempted to put Robbie back together? He was tempted, but, but then 
then he, he kind of backed out of it. But like I say, you know, if we can, all you need is about four people. Four, you know, I mean, well, you know, it's nice, we, to have, it, it's nice to have more. But with four, you can you can you can put on a demo. Yeah. Uh, no. Right. And, and what what your and th that new robot, Paul? That would be really nice for a. Um, uh, Eric often brought his robot to do this. This function is where you just hand the controller over to a kid to let the kid run the robot in a small contained space. Uh, the problem with uh, you know, Eric's robot is a tad fragile because uh, it's made out of Legos. Uh, so you know, if we could, if we had another robot that wasn't quite so fragile, that would be great. You know, to just set it up. Spe Spe doesn't that one have a uh, what do they call it? A first point, first person view. Doesn't I, it? I don't. I I think so, but I don't know. You know, it's got that. It's got that. Um, holder thing for holding some kind of a uh, game pad but I don't know what sort of a game pad fits in it yeah anyway what I'm saying is it would be interesting we could possibly you know like you say maybe meet and discuss it we have until the end of the month but that's not very long uh, well you can always piggyback on our entrance yeah. Because we're going to have a lot of space, I think. Um, okay. We've piggybacked on DPRG before, so yeah, you know. Okay. I, I could go. And, I could approach um, Ron and Eric and Mark and see if they are willing to assist um, and get a hold of that that uh, DJI robot and see what it takes to make it do do something yeah. fun I, yeah i think the thing the first thing to do is just kind of like have a uh maybe a, a session where we just gab about okay i can bring this demo i can bring that demo blah blah i can bring this robot whatever it is so we can see if we have critical mass yeah sure. harold harold's got so is this june or july uh, july 20th july. But we could, since we have uh, the contest on June 1, I think, and yeah. then uh, there's the weekend the, before that for testing. Uh, those are two opportunities to discuss it in, in more detail yeah, and, I mean, I, and formulate plans. Well, if it's, if it's June, if it's June, well, if it, well see, I was, I'm over it's here. July, it's July, July 20th. And, and so, I, so that's why I want to affirm. Uh, June's baked, right? I know it's July, so now... Um, I could possibly do that in July. I've got a, I haven't fired up Zemo, my six wheeled rover, which um, uh, is not autonomous really in any good way, but can be driven around and stuff. We want to put it in a confined space and it knows how to spin and do a whole bunch of other things. And I probably it's should, also, it's also should have, very, be perfect for Moon Day, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, it looks like a moon kind of thing. I mean, yeah. It, it's a it's a from the designed by the European Space Agency guys, so it looks very similar to that kind of thing. I haven't fired it up in over a year, so I have no idea what it looks like. But this, uh, I guess, is a way to uh, fire it up and see and see what we got and see what else we can do with it and do some things. I got the mm -hmm. rover, and of course, we can put old Jim Bot. He doesn't do a whole lot. But he runs forward, and runs back. You know, and he can do that a lot all by himself. You know, but mm -hmm. and then maybe Hugo Bot might have something to do, but I don't know. That's what I'm. That's why I'm halfway listening. Is because I'm refactoring yeah. Hugo Bot to maybe be able to have him do something. Yeah. Well, sometimes we have just static displays of robots too. They make good, yeah. you know, just in the background. We try to keep them out of the reach of people. Um, yeah. Just yeah, show you. I can, real, I show can you set up my robot, robot to uh, to do the uh, visual. Like I can just set up OpenMV. They hooked up to my camera and and also show the uh, time of flight arrays. Yeah, that would be cool. I'd, I think that would really be good, Mike. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I think, I think so, Paul. I think if you I mean, can we, find somebody to to be the you know the we got static. I mean, I, got, I mean the thing looks cool. It doesn't do anything, but it looks cool. And I've been working on it, make it look better and uh, be more whatever. 
uh, 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 well, Aaron, you got talking head, don't you? You have a head. Yeah, I got talking head, but he doesn't. He doesn't really. He doesn't travel well. Uh, <laughs> I know how that is. He don't travel well. You know. It looks like Medusa. <laughs> well, we don't. Have, it does have a little snaky looking with the wires back there, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and thought about all that, but uh, <laughs> you know. And and the other thing. The other deal is I don't want to bring my entire toy box to the outside world necessarily because <laughs> i got to bring it and bring it back and all that kind of stuff. Loading and unloading the cars are one of my favorite things. Um, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. Well, yeah no, 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 like, like Doug okay. said, you want about four people to like provide coverage so people can go take a walk around and look at what there is to see and you, know, you still have coverage for the table and stuff. I got a whole I got a whole shelves full of things that are easy to pack like that's art. It's got a thing in it that, that usually it's a D twenty spoots up. You know, I got a little sign thing and there's the robot a couple of robots that bring some 3D printing junk along if you want. I mean I've got stuff to show and I'm happy to show it. Um I just couldn't commit but I thought it was June. But I don't know it's July. We can probably make that. I don't know what the wife has got scheduled for. We can talk about it, though. So I, I could put my name down on a tentative thing. I'm happy to show up. And and as you know, all know, I am I can talk. So I can <laughs> engage with most people. So. Thank you, Harold. And and uh, and thank you, Mike. It sounds like you're, you'd are you be willing to support this as well. Yeah. So, so, Paul, would you like to meet at DPRG to look at Robbie? Robbie? Yeah, but I, I would, but um, we definitely need someone who's assembled it before because there's like a lot to it. We need to get like Ron or Doug or Dave Ackley, maybe, or um, probably those are the three guys who know how that yeah. thing goes together. You don't think we can figure it out? Guys don't need instructions. Yeah, well, this one, uh, really <laughs> Especially if I, if some of them are, parts are missing, Mike, it might make it a little challenge. <laughs> Mike, you know about home homemade things and how hokey they can be. Why should why would you be so optimistic? <laughs> well, okay, just, well, we'll just make it work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I could probably, uh, you know, I could probably come down there sometime if you guys can pick a date or time. You know, I don't know. I don't know, Paul. You're still working, right? No, no. You, you're retired. I'm retired. Mike's I'm retired. retired. Well, especially if we go down on some day that's not like Saturday afternoon. If you go something like Tuesday at ten or something like that, or yeah. Wednesday, you know. We, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I can probably figure out something with you guys. I'd love to see it. We can pull it down. Yeah. You know, that's the dog. Knock off the sixteen inches of dust that's on it. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, I can say, damn, I don't remember all of these parts. <laughs> we, can, we can have some fun. So how about, uh, how about next week sometime, like early next week maybe? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds fun. So, uh, unless, unless my, unless my uh, PCB board comes in. That's going to clear the deck. So it'll be my <laughs> first, first, first <laughs> yeah. I'm hearing uh, Doug, Doug, Mike, and Paul to um, see see what kind of, of evaluate and maybe try assembling Roby. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, hey, you know, Mike. I'm thinking might push it back. Well, maybe not. I'm saying it'd be nice to go ahead and make a lunch out of it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So Tuesday's good. Twenty first. Tuesday twenty first. Let me check my calendar. <clears throat> so say ten thirty. Yeah, figure us on at an hour. Then make it eleven thirty. Yeah, it'll probably take longer than an hour, so it'd be twelve. We could go catch lunch somewhere. Yeah. Well, you're invited if you want to come down. I don't. Isn't that over towards you? Uh, you're muted, Ray. At the Dallas Makerspace. Yeah. Uh, me? No, I'm about an hour away from the Dallas Makerspace. Oh, oh okay. Oh. Oh, okay. All right. I thought you were closer to that. 
Yeah. Oh, about 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm about 40, but 30, 30 probably. Yeah, so, but it's something that I'm willing to do. Now that I'm not driving my Jeep. Yeah. Um, that sounds great. Um, so, right. so Robbie's not like a, a Ikea where you got numbered parts and you put them all together with a instruction? No, no, definitely yep. not like Ikea. <laughs> More like there's a pile A and a pile B and a pile C. <laughs> And okay. I just nobody, knows, and like, nobody knows where Pile C is. <laughs> so, so. I just sent a meeting invite to Doug, Mike, Doug and Mike for Ken Thirty on the twenty first at DMS, and we'll do that. That'll be fun. And, and everybody, like, anybody else who wants to come is invited. Okay, yeah. we're not. You know, don't feel yeah. if you decide like you. Hmm, I'd like to see that myself. You're welcome to come join us. Okay. You know what, how about we put it down on the mailing list, Doug? Oh, you can do that. Yeah, and throw it out to the Discord, too, because there's other people. Yeah, that's right, good that point. Not here. I good mean, point. that's not what they're for. Because, like I say, you know, for all I know, Ron, I would, I would be highly, I would suspect that Ron Grant would be very interested. Okay. Is he on the ma new mailing list? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and then I'll especially if you threaten harm to Roby, yeah, just say, like, <laughs> yeah, good for, Ron really cares about Roby. Um, yeah. you know, he, he it was, uh, uh, he, um, well, I don't think there's speaking out of turn out of school to say, um, uh, his. Significant other said, "No, you spent enough time and brought brought and I got enough junk in the house. <laughs> Roby is not coming home." <laughs> That's basically, what I understood happened. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but it'd be fun. Um, yeah. Okay, well, that be that's great. That that'd be that'd be neat. Okay, so and, I guess uh, the dream to the ultimate answer is if we can find somebody to. To uh, you know, herd the cats. Mm -hmm. We probably come. Okay. I, th I think we got three people already just tonight, and probably got a. We can probably rustle up another one or two yeah. fairly easily. So yeah. I feel like we got something that we can get going here, and it and it really is. You know, it's in line with the DPIG's mission um, to you know do outreach and educate people about robots and. Um, and it's something that we always used to do. It's a good public relations kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I support it. I like yeah. it. Well, Paul, the way I view it, you know, 2024 was the year we were going to come back. Right. All right. This is part of coming back. Exactly. I, 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 agree. If you don't, I mean, doing I some of these social interactions it's definitely something we need to be doing. You know, yeah. like, I'm sure, you know, we could do the Fort Worth Museum. They, I'm sure they would want to do do something. They always did something once a year for the kids. So, you know. Anyway, cool. All right, so we'll take it to the mailing list, expand to the mailing list and, and, uh, and, and the Discord. Thanks for bringing that up. Kareem, sure. um, I had seen you post that on the Discord, and it sort of dropped off my radar. And um, sorry for that, but uh, but I, I, like Doug says, I think it's part of what DPRG always did, what it should do, and um, and it's always a fun thing to get together and um, play with robots and meet a bunch of people and tell them what what cool stuff we do. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, let's see. I think the next, um, I think the, the the next on the list. We, that, that was the end of the full compiled list, but um, I we we I got put on the list somewhere, and now is as good as time as any for um, a visit to the lab. Ms. Yes. Unless if we're finished with the last topic. Yeah. 
so um, I went went out and met Dale Wheat, who used to be a, a member of DPRG for a long time ago. Um, he's still making blinky lights for all he's worth and and having having a lot of fun doing it. Um, and uh, and Brady Pamplin, who did the talk at the last month's meeting. Um, and uh, Doug, he was super happy to hear that uh, that you've sent three three orders off to JCL PCB. Yeah. Um, and uh, so then they took me over to um, the lab.ms, which is uh, I think it's basically a about a five room maker space um, over in Richardson. It's a lot smaller than I mean DMS is huge. Um, but it's a I thought it was a really comfortable space um, and more affordable um, uh, than than DMS. Um, and uh, what is it, what is their price? Uh, so it's forty or if you're over sixty five, it's twenty, so half price. So I mean that's real affordable. Um, in terms of equipment, and rooms, um, they've got a room dedicated to 3D printers and the laser cutter, which is, look like, you know, so it's about probably, I'm going to guess, two feet wide, maybe two and a half by one and a half, I'm going to guess. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the laser cutter, and then they've got uh, a couple of, a couple of what they told me were relatively high-end 3D printers, um, the, there was one that had could feed four spools of... Um, yeah, they got, they've got a bamboo, they got a bamboo carbon X, yeah. X carbon, yeah, which okay. is the new hotness, coolest thing you can actually, uh, normal people can actually get these days anyways. And yeah, with four, four um, filaments mm -hmm. that it can feed and intersperse dynamically. Yeah. Um, and then they had another about an eight hundred dollar um, printer, I guess. Uh, so I, I don't remember its name. You probably know its name. The Bursa. The Bursa. They probably have a Bursa. Yeah, yeah, that was it. And then they had um, several uh, several um, uh, resin resin printers. Um, mm. So that was cool. So that was the that was the printing in space. Then they had a big. Pretty big um, woodworking shop with, I mean, not not nearly as big as DMS's woodworking shop. I mean, that that place is humongous. But um, had a CNC router with about, I'm going to say, maybe a three foot by three foot bed. Um, do you remember and, the name of it? I do not. It's, really, it's not a Chapeco or whatever they call it. Yes. Yes, it was. Oh, okay. Like shop, 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 shop Echo. Yeah, something like that. Shape the Echo, I think. Yeah, yes. Okay. Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that that's kind of old school now. There's there's he uses belts and a few other things now. Now in home routers, you can get ones that are using bowl, oh. bowl, bowl screws and and linear rails and okay. and uh, you know high powered routers and. Do. And then there was a, in the the wood shop had the usual selection of wood of woodworking gear, you know, table saw, um, router, um, jigsaws, bandsaw. Um, How about people? Were they being all the tools being used? So I went in at uh, six and left about seven fifteen. And no, there were only about um, there was only one person in the wood shop at that time, um, and one person in the conference room. And that was about it. Um, one person just wandering, a couple of people just wandering around. Doug, Ain Doug Ames walked in after a while, so that was nice to yeah. see him. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you because I know somebody that just got on the board there. His name is Tim Rayburn. And they do; they are having a push, much like we are, to grow their population. Yeah, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I don't know. In fact, yeah. So they they're pushing on that too to grow and be they're bigger. Fairly, as well. fairly reasonable electronics station. So um, 
air, uh, a surface mount air tool, air, air soldering tool, and um, 100 megahertz four channel scope and um, uh, frequency analyzer, power supply, usual usual electronics tools, and you know it was like not not high end by any means, but decent. You know, the sort of stuff that you might have some of it at home, but maybe not all of it. Um, like I don't have any yet. SM, SMD work, work, rework stuff. Um, and then there was another room that was the sewing and uh, vinyl cutting room with a bunch of vinyl cutters. And then another room that was a um, meeting space with just a bunch of tables, essentially, um, and junk stashed, or stashed that they were in the process of getting rid of. And um, I'm going to say... That was the bulk of it. So I want to see. Yeah. You, you may not know some of the history that, um, uh, Paul, we actually, uh, for a while there, decided at one time because we have the east west problem, you know, people who live around I 35 and people who live around 75. And so we were thinking about having a meeting, like every third meeting at the lab. We actually had two or three lab meetings. This is probably around uh, uh, 2017, 18, when they were in their old location before they were picked up by the city of Richardson. And at that time, all they had was a couple of printers and uh, and one laser and an office for area. And the, and they may have had an empty room that they used for crafts, but I don't remember it. Mm. Um, so they've come a little bit. They've come away, you know. So there's, uh, and they've been around for a while. So they are, mm. you know. But like I said, we actually had meetings at the the lab in their old location. I didn't realize. They were, I was wondering who they were sponsored by, if anybody. And so interesting to hear they that the. the it's part of Richard City of Richardson because uh, someone was saying at the time that they they used to use that room with that, that was really has been designated a gaming room now or a meeting room. Um, they used to use it as a classroom, but now now um, apparently the City of Richardson said, "Hey, just go over to the library. It's just up the street, and they got a big meeting room there for any uh, any makerspace kind of meetings or." Lectures, talks, trainings, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't... I'll have to go down there and check it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... That was it. Um, okay. Oh, and... <laughs> Sounds like Mike has got something he wants to talk yeah, about. Yeah, right. I, ju I forgot, I didn't have you on my li mental list, Mike. I apologize for that. The floor is yours. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so I've been working hard, uh, trying to get ready. And so I've, so one thing I did is I, I cranked up the speed and everything worked pretty good, except when I tried to have angular speed while it was uh, tracking a, a can, like a dynamic. So I, mean, I think what was what's wrong is the uh, there's such a long delay from my camera going through Ross, going through the well, serial port, going through Ross, doing this and this, and actually feeding feeding it back through Ross to the to the wheels that uh, it, it was just going like this. So I slowed, I slowed, I slowed it back down only when it was moving towards a, a can. Like if it's going to a waypoint, nothing. It was all static, so it could just go fast and it could turn fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I, I think I sped it up. I think I could speed it up a little more going straight. I think I got my, my oh. rotation by, that speed is about yeah. as fast hey, as I Mark? can do. Yeah. Uh, may I Remember I was talking earlier about the Hall of Fames? You can go back in the Hall of Fame and see per past performances, and so you know what you're up against. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just telling you that so that you, you yeah. know, you're not surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to go. Well, I think the whole thing is like faster is better. Yeah. 
<laughs> faster is better. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you first you got to get nine points, or you're not even in the running. Right. Right. Yeah, or six points, I guess. Six points. You have to get six. All six cans in. Oh yeah. 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 So. Yeah, so the, the other thing I was working on is the uh, blob or the can detection using blob detection and color and and I tighten I, I I'm rotating through about six different color threshold sets mm -hmm. to just uh, make sure that well I'm putting a really tight uh, height and well when it draws a, a, a triangle a, a square around the can um, I'm given a pretty high tolerance about the height and width ratio which is like the can is 6.5 by 12 millimeters or centimeters I think yeah <laughs> and, and so I'm trying to make sure that the triangle the little rectangular it draws uh, on, on the camera when it bounds the can uh, matches that and like if you have some shadows on the can it can make it weird so yeah. so if i change the uh, color then i can get a I, I can get a pretty good rectangle pretty good yeah uh, i and, will say this this mike you might be overthinking that uh basically what i found is you go after the biggest biggest blob yeah yeah well i, I look for the biggest one is the closest one so I want, so well, basically once once i yeah. got the got the things the right shape then i just go to the closest one right. yeah because yeah yeah i'm just trying yeah, to and, and another thing that i found is instead of like trying to pick up 10 blobs limit the blobs to one and that's the largest one that way if you see other cans or if you have somebody with pink pink shoes on the background oh, yeah. it, it yeah. doesn't matter yeah yeah it's basically about time it gets to the uh to my code, uh, the camera strips off everything except for one choice. Okay. And I also put a, I, I, I reduce the area of interest once I pick one and still keep enough around it so that when the uh, device moves, it stays within that area of interest. And if somehow it loses focus, then it'll widen up to a big area of interest and pick, and pick one and then try to follow it. Okay. So, Oh, well, I'm, I'm probably overthinking it, but but that's but I've been just when I'm running test runs, it's like oh my gosh, <laughs> I can't decide which can to go to. It's oscillating between them and stuff. Uh, and also, I noticed that if there's the cans are pretty dense, like if it sees one can behind another, it gets a little confused. And uh, yeah, that's why the question you have there is how wide do you make your jaws? Because like, it, like you said, if you have two cans, one staggered behind the other one, the, the blob that you see is one blob that's more than the width. Now you say you're doing some sort of ratio thing, but I don't, I don't do that. But anyway, so you, what you want to do is you don't want your, you want your can, to, can catcher to be big enough to handle that, that situation. Yeah, one time it grabbed both cans. <laughs> well, and if you do that, if, if, you, if you do that in competition, the judge <laughs> will take one of the cans immediately. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then, then another thing is, I was noticing when a can is close to the wall, my I'm using a, an array of time of flight sensors to try to find the can that might not be right in front of, of it because. When it approaches a can and using obstacle detection with another can close to it, it might veer off and then it switches to the time of flight. So so it's not just a single time of flight sensor detecting a can. I use I use uh, an array of them and then I try to figure out which which of the uh, time of flight sensors in that array are actually on the can. Mm -hmm. And when it's close to the wall, it has a it, it gets confused, especially when when the robot is like the the wall is here and the robot is well it's at an angle with the wall and and it sort of sees the oh well, sees the cannon wall so i'm working on that and i think i have a i think i have an idea and i'm about you know that close to getting it working okay and yeah. and, and the next thing is 
is I got obstacle detection and it sees the wall as an obstacle when the can's pretty close and it just <laughs> it throws it off. So I gotta figure out how to solve that. Mm. Like it's close to the wall, I gotta turn off obstacle detection or something like that. Uh, yeah. But that's something um, I haven't I haven't quite started working on yet. Mm. I mean, it works okay with obstacle detection off. It's just sort of wax cans. <laughs> yeah. If it knocks them down, that's not good. So yeah, and now, well, one thing in obstacle detection is there's something in the field, it slows down more so that it, if it, if it hits a can, it sort of rubs it instead of knocking it over. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, so. Mike, you, you know what I thought would, might make a kind of a neat demo, um, just talking, going back for a minute to um, the, the, the um, Moon Day exhibit is um, your your three time of flight senses and you know that that uh gooey i did that displays the range of the time of flight senses so you know i i i it's the sort of thing where kids will stand in front of it and move around and mm -hmm. see their image display moving around on the on the display yeah 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 so so yeah we could we could try that yeah but I'm just showing you the, the cans close to the wall and I'm trying to make sure I can detect that can there on, on my little test setup there. So, so the, uh, the, I figured the cans, if it's you know, if it's right touching the wall, it's gonna be impossible, it's gonna be really hard. So I'm hoping that when you put a can out, it's, it's like six inches from the wall or something. It's, <laughs> that's the, that's the rules, right? That's the rules, a can can't be right next to the wall. Oh. If I remember the rules correctly, there has to be a certain distance from the wall. It won't be just slam right up into it. I think that's a, 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 a more of a suggestion. I believe it is that something like typically a judge won't put them more than six inches from the wall. Uh, okay. But, but it, it says uh, the next sentence is, uh, you know, but that's the judge's discretion. Okay. And, and generally what, what the idea is is, they try to match, you know, they want people to be successful. They don't want people to, uh, uh, but if people are really nailing it, we try to make it a little harder on them, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, well, that, that's my objective is six inches. So, yeah, yeah. At, at any angle approaching yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah so that's, uh, that's what I've done, and I'm, I'm, I'm going forward pretty good. Cool. And I'm using the, uh, so I have the uh, six can working and the uh, quick trip and the four corner. And I just have a, another test routine, which is just going to a bunch of waypoints just to exercise it. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to be in a mall. That's good. So I got a few things here. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Tom. Um, three things in total. First, uh, I can't resist bragging. I picked up a couple of these today. Uh, so this will be my gentle entry into uh, using some LIDARs. They're both supposed to work. We'll see when I when I start taking them apart next month. <laughs> I have no time this month. Uh, these were 20 bucks each. So I thought that was a pretty wow, good that's deal. Really, that's really, if they work, that's great. Yeah. And they seem to be well documented. So we'll, we'll find out. Do uh, they have a, uh, let me ask you this. Are they like... Uh, like the other type, do they have a, a USB port on them? Yes, they do. That's cool. And, yeah. and apparently a very large uh, ARM-based Linux processor, which is based on the little bit of reading I did this morning, is not generally accessible for any other purpose. Mm -hmm. Cool. Locked up tight. So, anyway, just so I understand, you, you bought these so you can reprogram the robot as a whole or just to, like, remove the LiDAR? Yeah. Chris, uh, once I start to work on them, I'll probably play with with uh, utilizing their basically their internal API through the USB port, just to play with. Okay. But the intention is to get my hands on a LiDAR, at least one, so I'll certainly take one of them apart um, in order to apply it uh, and program it myself with my own processor. Uh, there's just been some casual mentioning in the, the hour or so I was reading up on them this morning where some people had been attempting to uh, provide their own code on the ARM processor that's on board these things. And apparently that's very hard to do. 
But I don't know. I don't know anything about it beyond what I was reading online. 20 bucks each, huh? 20 bucks Canadian each. <laughs> That's wow. very good. That's really good. Yes. Really good prices. Yeah, I just brought them home a couple of hours ago, so I haven't done much other than other than confirm that, for example, they've been sitting in somebody's shelf so long the batteries don't run. <clears throat> so they're going to go through my battery tester. And we'll see what happens. Uh, the second thing is uh, I'm slowly making progress on my own robot. Uh, I'm attempting to make it drive in a straight line, and that's harder than I thought. Yeah. Uh, especially since my speed regulators on my cheapo ro robot motors are not the best. So I've uh, I've disabled the speed regulators because I find that, that if I just submit, I just give a, a pulse width modulation signal to the motors, they run together somewhat better than they do with the speed regulators. They still wander, so I've implemented a simple proportional heading error corrector, which is working extremely well. So, uh, so I, th I think I can now make my robot drive in a reasonably straight line, within a few degrees at least. Yeah. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that. Uh, are you using the uh, DF robot uh, motors, or are you going to? Are you still using the ones with the little? Still using the yellow TTs, and I, with I don't want to take time to change them for anything else at this point. Okay. Well, but clearly they're the worst motor available. Uh, well, I can tell you that. Uh, you know the typical strategy is uh, is a pit on a speed, and then surround that pit with a angular uh, heading error. Yeah, Doug, Doug I, I agree with you completely, and that was my plan. But I'm having a, a difficult time getting the speed regulators on these motors to run well. I've built them on a couple of other robots with no problems, mm. but I I think it's mainly because these poor pits are starved for feedback because of the 20 pulse per okay. wheel revolution feedback. All right. So you just so you 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 surrounded this with a, a heading error error uh, pid loop yeah, yeah. or it, probably a p loop. It, basically I'm I'm at the point where I simply want to convince my I want to give my robot a target location, you know, knowing what its current pose is. I want to give it a target location and say go there in a reasonably straight line so you get there. It's that simple. And oh, that's, I think I'm getting a lot closer to that now. Yeah, that should work. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm happy with you that. Know, I, I mean, I've actually seen a PID drive in a straight line with square with square wheels. <laughs> I, my, my, you know, and strange things like one wheel five times bigger than the other, and they still drive in a straight line. I, I, I mentioned I built a, uh, a Wowie Tribot. Uh, with three three wheels, three uh, uh, of those sideways wheels, and it did not run well at all until I put a speed regulator on each one of those gear motors. And when I put that on, I could make it do whatever I wanted it to do. So I know I can make them work, but that that Wowie tri motor uh, device has much higher pulse rates coming from its encoders, yeah. which are well, not the motors themselves. You know, I don't know what they cost in cost in uh, Canada, but here in the United States, you can buy those DF TT motors. They drop right in for seven dollars and fifty cents. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but at this point, I'm I, I'm close enough to getting this thing to work for purposes of my goal as of June the first. Okay. And I don't want to disturb my pat my my progress along that path too much. I still okay. have a huge amount of work to do. Okay. So that's why I'm. So you guys are you're still meeting at your house, right? Yeah, so that's the, the next thing I wanted to uh, mention. We Pat and I had originally said, well, let's just do a six-scan contest at, uh, at my house. Um, but maybe we should try to do some of the other contests that are part of RoboRama. Pat and John comments? Well, John's, well, do, John's doing a quick trip. Well, that's yeah. exactly what I was looking at. I was just reading up on the contest rules. I don't see any problem with that. Yeah, and I mean, if you've got a, a wheeled robot that can do quick trip, I mean, we, it, it's the same course, so we just have to lay out the course. My, my wheeled robot will do quick trip before it will do six can. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, Tom. I'm in the same boat that I think the quick trip is going to be uh, more feasible than the six can at this point. Quick, quick trip looks easy to set up in my carport. I see no problems with that. I assume we can mark it with tape on the ground. Yeah, you, you need four feet by 17 feet, basically. That's easy, yeah. 
Uh, four corner competition. Do we want to do that? Yeah. John and Pat. I, I won't be doing a four corner. Not that how, how big is the four corner square? It can be a minimum eight feet on a side, according to the rules. Yeah. But we would, we would really think you should be around 12 feet. Can, cannot do that on my carport. Oh, okay. Well, if your carport can do eight feet. We, yeah, we've got 10 and a half feet maximum, that's all. Oh, do 10 feet then. You want it, it to be as long as possible. But you yeah, got to make sure that but even, you want to make sure that you have room, you know, for your robot. Because yeah. your robot's not going to go just around the four squares. It's going to be some safe distance away from the square. Yeah, okay. Ten, ten, ten feet puts it basically right up against the walls. So that's okay, not. Okay, so great. it sounds like eight feet's about the best you can do. Yeah. And you could probably yeah. do eight by twelve, though, right? Yes, we could. Yep, yeah, if we can do rectangular. Yeah. Yeah, well, it'll be four corner. I think it's called four corner, so it's I don't think it four really. Corners, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay, go for right. it. So we should plan for that. Just uh, one quick question for Pat and John: uh, If you're going to try six can, are you sensitive to the color of the can? I have no orange tape and hadn't planned I, to buy any. I have, I have the official. Off of Amazon. Okay, so, tape, so. so John, maybe you can bring it with you. Yep. <laughs> Are you yeah, willing I, to share? That's the question. I will not. I will not be doing six can. But. Uh, oh, okay, Pat. I I may try to find a can, but at this point, I I highly doubt it. I may run over some cans. Yeah. No, John. John, the, John, the only reason the orange is if you're if you're using uh, video. I I and, won't be using video. Yeah, because I am not using video. Yeah. John? Yeah, well, like I said, I'm not going to be competing in six cans, oh, so it's okay. irrelevant right. to me. Then, then it probably doesn't matter to us. I, In order to make sure that we have a reasonable texture, I can cover these with some other duct tape that I have in my workshop. Yeah, well, I, I can I can bring this stuff, too, so we can, okay. you know, I mean, that, that won't be a problem. <laughs> Can you make them out of steel with a magnet in them so that <laughs> easy to find that way? I, I, nice, Pat. Nice. After listening to Mike's comment, I think it was Mike his comment about the surface of the of the uh, one of the rooms at the Dallas Maker Center that seems to be kind of rough. I went and I ran one of these on the concrete surface of my carport to see how well it slides. <laughs> It does slide okay. <laughs> hmm. Hey, Tom. Yep. It's just an FYI, the, the old Neato uh, LIDARs. Uh, there was a guy, I want to say his name was David LaCroix. Is that right? He used to make the little little board that went with these. Yeah, I think he still does. Oh, he I, does. Okay. I mean, I, I don't think it's David, though. Oh. Uh, I'm trying to think of what his name is. Something like Croy, right? Because they, they take similar a, a serial interface and a motor controller, a speaker. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, basically it parses the data that comes out of it. And, um, Is it uh, James Leroy? Ah, James Leroy. Oh, well, I was somewhat close. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Anyway, yeah, so... <clears throat> He's actually, he sells a board he's like actually on, the, on the DPIG mailing list and responded that he wants to want to be migrated to the new list. So um, he's okay. contactable. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, when I did a quick scan of the DPRG website, I saw a couple of you mentioned as working with the Nido LIDARs. But how many others of you have done work with that particular LIDAR? Another one? Oh, oh, they're really popular. So when yes. I have questions next month, I'll know who to ask. This one is uh, not functional right now because this is a little piece of that belt that uh, yes. makes the I, thing turn. I, I, the same thing happened to mine. Oh, it did? I threw it out. Oh, you threw it out. Wow. I threw, I threw it out along with the teeny, teensy board that used to used to run with it. I was like, Oh, no. I don't know if you can get one. those belts anywhere. So, Probably from that, so my one thing you might want to consider is, and I know it, it just costs more dollars, right, is the 
those old Nito LiDAR units, even though you can find code and you can make it work in RAWs, I guess you can make it work without RAWs. I guess those things are so old that it just, you might be less support for it. You might just end up having to put a bit more labor into getting everything to work compared to buying an RP LiDAR, right? The cheaper, yeah. <coughs> the cheapest RP LiDAR, I think it's down to $100 or maybe even below. They've been falling in, 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 in price. You know, so the entry level RP LiDAR is just slightly better than that Nito LiDAR, and it's essentially the same thing, just packaged a little differently. Uh, oh, but, but Chris, it's like more turnkey, right? That? It's just it's more turnkey and it works, and you know. But how much fun is that if it just works? <laughs> yeah, but you want to focus. You want to focus on troubleshooting the LiDAR unit. By yeah. using the data, I, I admit I don't want to repeat my yellow TT gear motor experience again. <laughs> if I had more time, I would not be using them anymore. Okay, thank you. That was uh, quite the hardware. Yep, half the process is the path you follow to get there. <laughs> Thanks. So, John and Pat, if you have any questions, we can follow up with email and we can work out any other details we need for this contest. The only thing that may stop us if we is if we have torrential rain, which has a tendency to flood my carport. So, other than that, we should be fine. Aquatic robots? No. <laughs> bring a boat. <laughs> or at least a swamp vehicle. <clears throat> yeah, bring water wings. So, Mickey Dean, um, uh, I just posted a question to you. Did you receive a message from DPRG list over the weekend to the effect? So the subject line was, why so many humanoid robots? I saw that. And, uh, and same question for uh, David Steele. You guys could just reply in chat or voice or whatever. I'm trying to close the loop um, because I've now, uh, out of 96, 95 email addresses that I'd contacted during the migration campaign, um, 72 opted in to the new uh, Google Groups. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 68 opted in. There's now a total of 72 people in the new Google Groups. Uh, message uh, uh, email group um, 25 people didn't reply to the original emails to the original list or to direct mails so they're going to get dropped um, there are 47 so far out of the 72 on the list who've act who said that they are um, receiving the the new DPIG list emails. So I'm still trying to close out the last 20. I think you've done your due diligence, Paul. You've put a lot of work into that. It was it was a long haul and but I'm trying to complete it. I'm really trying to, you know, but it's getting harder and at some point I'll give up and It'd be nice if I could get to more than 44 out of 72. You just got one more confirmation. Yeah. So, Mickey Dean, you never, you never did answer my question. Did you or did you not receive the email? Oh, you did not. Uh, did you look in your spam to see if there was a, um, a spam email? Um, subject was why so many humanoid robots Paul I found several other entries in that uh, forum extremely interesting to read so oh, yeah yeah it's quite a he's quite a prolific writer on technical topics like that yeah oh oh his blog series yeah, it's fantastic. 
It's like he you can tell he has the scars from <laughs> attempting to do really hard things that intuitively you'd think would be really straightforward, <laughs> but they're not. Okay, what else have we got going on? people ran across during the week. That's interesting. I ran across something. <clears throat> David? Yeah. You said you uh, ran across something. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Y'all see my screen now? Okay. So, um, I ran across these uh, robots. Um, they're used for planting vegetables and stuff like that. It's an automated process. Oh, cool. And they're quite large, which surprised me. And they were talking about these able to lift a thousand pounds. I was hoping they were a little bit smaller. And I'll, I'll switch over to a different screen here. So, so I'm hearing that they're better suited to carrying kegs around than cans of beer. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> so the thing that brought my attention to them was apparently they must be having financial difficulties and they're auctioning off these robots <laughs> so here's from the auction site Kareem did you hear that another auction <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. I already looked at that stuff and they're like yeah they're a little bit on the large side for even me <laughs> Yeah, if they were a little bit smaller, I, I would go down. This this is down at Lockhart, Texas, down by Austin. Uh, but it's it's right I, now. I think they were listing for like under five hundred or something when I looked yeah, at them. Yeah, right now the them. current bid is four hundred and ten dollars for the highest one, and they retail. They have a retail here sixty eight thousand dollars. Yeah, they, they look nicely engineered. Yeah, they do. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're selling off all of the equipment. So I think this is the fast charger for them. And then uh, um, different other components, uh, like the, the trays that they were carrying the the plants around on there for sale and so forth but I was thinking for $410 you know you could just about tear it down and grab the motors out of it the vision sensors and all that stuff and and make something a little bit smaller that is if you don't have to carry kegs of beer around <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, Do you know if it's uh, using odometry or vision, or is it using embedded wires in the concrete? Uh, that's a good question, and I, I don't know. I'll... I really doubt that we're, that we'd be using uh, sensor wires embedded in the concrete. Yeah, I'm almost thinking that Pretty sure those radio. Those are... You can put a seat on it and just use it like a chair. There you go. 
moderately. Those advanced. are very similar to the pallet robots used in like war, uh, uh, warehouses, yeah. Amazon and such. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the the plan was to uh, hedge bets that you know growing marijuana was going to be legalized and you know they'd be able to make a lot more money on them so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right i could tell you anyone that invested in that in canada has lost money Seriously? oh really oh yeah you cannot grow weed for less than the dealer <laughs> oh my goodness he doesn't have a store. He doesn't have a giant warehouse full of uh, product. You know? and, and he's not regulated, so he doesn't have the extra fees and stuff he's got to deal with. He may not even be paying taxes. Exactly. <laughs> I used to work uh, quite a bit at uh, Edmonton, Alberta, and out by the airport. Oh, man, there was, uh, I think, a dozen... Uh, sheds like this being built just for, for weed. I, I think there might be three left in Canada they're saying right now. Is that wow. right? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, so a lot of them it, never even got never got off the ground. That they, they got everything in place. They had the backers. They sold the shares. Everything. But it just came down to the cost of electricity, the cost of real estate, the cost of labor is just all too expensive to, to do it that way. Hmm. You you can't beat the Mexicans or the Colombians at doing it. Yeah, but I mean, there's a zillion stores that sell the stuff. Like yeah, there is a zillion stores. I'm not saying it's not being sold. I'm I'm saying that, that they're not making a lot of profit on it. Yeah, and well, that could all, be. All of the IPOs, like I say, most of the originals have tanked. There's I think there's three left. And they're well, well below the IPO offering on the share prices. Yeah. Are you talking about the distribution stores or the growing facilities? The, the, the growing uh, facilities. So the distribution stores, I believe the prices are regulated by the government. There's very little leeway in, in what they sell it for. Just mm. like a pack of cigarettes or a bottle of booze, it's... Very well regulated. It sure is funny how far it's come since I was in college, and well, that's what people's closets were for. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't, I can't tell you exactly how how well that stuff works or not, but my uh, 3D printed uh, hydroponics tower I have at uh, we had to start over about a month and a half ago when the big rain came and knocked everything over because. Anyway, I got it better fixed now. I, I'm starting to finally get some tomatoes and stuff out of it. And I, I don't really have that many tomatoes blooming out of them yet. I don't have tomatoes on it. But these are some of the thickest tomato plants I've ever seen uh, growing and stuff. I mean, we compare to what's growing in the buckets further out in the yard. And it, I got to say, my biggest tomato here is about a, uh, if, well, if you're looking at my fingers, they're their main stalk comes in about a pinky and mine are coming in about a thumb coming off the off the tower right so i don't know if they're better or worse or whatever and i still haven't got any fruit off of it i got a few that are coming and so it, anyway it's an experiment on the thing it's kind of cool you know on the whole thing but yeah. kind of cool do you have a link your 3D printed setup. Yeah, I'll have to go look it up. Once I can. I, it's a YouTube video that I started. Okay. Looking, uh, I was curious. 
What sort of sensors is everyone using to detect color for both? I'm using the OpenMV camera. H7, uh, Pixie yeah. cams, or, you know, the original, and I think Doug uses number two, Pixie two. Um, I just use a webcam. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody ever used the Husky lens? Doug has. Okay. You're muted, Doug. Green, you've got a lot of experience with the Husky, right? In the in, in the uh, first. Uh, other other teams use it in first. We haven't used the Husky lens specifically. I've played with it. It's not Any? bad, I guess. I mean, there's better. There's better, but you know, I can't remember what it's selling for. Uh, when I got mine, it was like off the Kickstarter, and it was kind of cheap. And uh, so I don't know what they, I don't even know what they cost anymore. What do they cost? Uh, I think they're still around $50. But mm -hmm. I, I, they're probably okay for $50. Um, but, you know, you might, uh, like everybody else is using the, uh, what is it called? Open MV. Yeah. That's real nice. Uh, uh, if you want dead simple for, blob detector, then I would say go with a, a Pixie. I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that. The, the nice thing about the Husky lens is that, uh, you know, this actually got AI, AI models in it, and there's a lot of things you can do with it. Uh, I just found setting up the little interface and everything, I found it to be a pain in the butt. Uh, what about programming? I, I didn't find a lot of resources as far yeah, as... Yeah, it's not meant to be. It's meant to be an appliance. Yeah. Okay. So And so, you know, you, you program it to select the function, and like if you're training it on cats, you know, you take mm -hmm. pictures of cats and train it, and then, then you say learn, and it learns it, and then that's what you get. Now, if you, you know, if you absolutely, like I say, the OpenMV substitute is the maxi bit, but, yeah. you know, the question you have to ask yourself, it, it's kind of, the maxi bit is, is kind of a, the end of the line type product, you know, and the o OpenMV is continuously being evolved product. <laughs> You know, the difference is one costs thirty dollars and the other one costs a hundred and twenty dollars, I believe. Okay. It might now, yeah. So you have to, you know, it, if you just want to dabble your your feet in it and you're willing to look up the links that you need for the software, then the the maxi bed is the cheapest way to go. Yeah. The thing that the Open MV camera has going for it is it has a very rich library. Right. We're doing way more than just color blob detection. I mean, it Absolutely. does color yeah. blob detection really well, but it does a lot of other open CV type stuff as well. Well, the maxi bit does. The maxi bit was meant to be an alternative for the uh, for the Open MV. It uses yeah. the same interface uh, and everything. So, but like I say, you know, I hate to steer. It's, if somebody's just starting off, mm -hmm. I would say, go ahead and buy the Open MV. In the end, you'll probably be easier. Now, if you told me, well, I've been working with all this shit for a long time, then I would say, go ahead and try the maxi bit and see if you, if you, or if you're saying, all I got is thirty dollars, then I'd go for the maxi bit. Now, so, I, I, I used, I just bought the Open MV RT. 1062 thinking oh. that i would just get the the best one you know the latest one that has the most power and when i got it i found out that some of its software functions some of its library functions that the other cameras have aren't set up yet and that was because the other ones are based on stm 32 and open and the rt 1062 is a new processor and so a lot of the hardware libraries just don't exist yet. 
Okay. okay. Have you what? checked recently? I know he he publishes updates all the time. Yeah, I, I updated. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, one, one of my updates messed it up, and the next one fixed it again. So. Yeah. Hey Ray, do you have the H seven? Yeah, just the H seven, not the plus. Okay. The what? What about this R two? Is that the one you have? That's the one that um, Mike has, I think. The RT. Now Mike is, he's got the RT ten sixty two. He's got the one on that costs one hundred and twenty bucks. I'm trying to figure out: Do you have the eighty dollar one or the eighty five dollar one? Are you asking me or Mike? You. Oh no, I have the the uh, eighty dollar one. The just the plain Open H7. MD H seven. I guess it's R two in that diagram. Have they talked anything about yeah. killing support? Uh, nope. Yeah, it's, so, um, it's so I think the well. sweet the sweet spot here probably is the uh, Open MV Cam H seven plus. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, probably the sweet spot. Five dollars more. And, yeah. and does it work out outdoors? Yeah. Yeah. For like cone detection. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I used it on the. Yeah, I mean, you got to program it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yeah. The Husky lens, I've got one, but I just haven't found a lot of support. You yeah, know, well, documentation it, for it. Yeah, well, it, my biggest problem with it was the interface. Mm -hmm. I mean, the functionality that it offers is actually quite good for the price. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, but you got to realize it's never going to get any better. Okay, because it's it's an appliance. You know, it's like you went out and bought a certain model car. That's it. You know, and yeah. uh, you know, and so I I have one because, like I said, I sometimes support Kickstarters and. When I did, you know, and I and I've used it. I've used it for line following, and I've used it for. I don't know if I've used it for blob detection or not. It 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 can do. Can, you can make a small can model on it if you wanted a can, or or if you wanted to do cones, you can do that. Uh, I mean, it's but I, like I say, it's kind of a weird. You have to push a bunch of buttons, and you can because. It's essentially, you're training the, the the Husky lens. You're training it uh, through the three buttons or two buttons that you have there that you can push. And yeah. I just found it awkward. Yeah. So Seed Studio sells uh, this, which is a, a Grove um, AI vision module. Yeah. Um, and it uses uh, an OV56 whatever camera that doesn't come with it. You have to get your own camera. And, and this is one I bought off like the pie shop or whatever, um, the camera. But this, this board is like 15 or 16 bucks US. And it runs models for object detection. Um, and they have a website where you can, you can install a bunch of predefined models um, I haven't used it for anything other than validating finally that it works properly, um, and it does. So uh, it's another really inexpensive option if you're looking for something that that is a little more programmable and is current and um, allows you to run models. And, and apparently you can set up your own models, although it's a non-trivial process, but you can train your own models like the... The, the way you would do with a Raspberry Pi, um, you know, using like a YOLO V8 or whatever model. Yeah, uh, I know. I know by, the way, by the way, I did post uh, a few minutes ago. I was waiting for a break before I forget because my brain is going. I did post a link to the video that I used um, oh. in, the, in the chat. It's a few It's a few posts back. That, okay, uh, yep. It, it contains all the SELs, the bill of materials, uh, or, or at least a place to go get them anyways. Okay. And then I, okay, and here's another option that I like Articams, and they really leverage the privilege, their, 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 their line. 
Otherwise, the OGs are, they have depth cameras and accelerated AI models. Okay, that's the OG. Now, it could be OG Lite or OG D or OG S or all, but that's all their OGs. They also have one that they just call Articam, which all it is is a depth camera, if that's what you want to go. And they also make one now that I mentioned earlier. It's this little, it's this little metal box one. And what it is, oh, it's called a, a Pi Inside. And it, it's just the accelerated AI part of the Oak D. And I, I want to say it's $70 or something like that. It's cheaper than an Oak D light. <laughs> so, so you can get, you can get them depth and accelerated AI. Accelerated AI or just depth. They're all available. So that that's I mean, it's something to look at. Yeah, and Luxonis is the company that makes all the oak stuff. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they have like ridiculous amount of support and, and forums and examples and all that sort of stuff. So So with the open M V what sort of processing power do you need? I mean, can well, you... you don't, it, no. it runs, it's, it's self-contained. Yeah. So you could interface it with an Arduino or a yeah, you could. Raspberry you, Pi? Or, yeah, you can yeah. interface. Yeah, you basically get a serial port and mm -hmm. you can export um, basically metadata. So if you're looking for color blobs, it'll tell you how many color blobs it, see, it sees and what the location and bounding box of each one is. Um, and it'll do that on, on, at a whatever frames per second. Um, it, the OpenMV, the interface to it is written in MicroPython. Um, so you, you can write your own code that runs on the camera um to you know basically combine and extract and do different things um as you like yeah the thing is is I think, so you know i always and i, and I the terms of are, are kind of variable but i've always thought of the open mv as sort of a machine learning camera okay and the ogs is more of a a the uh, accelerated AI camera. And those are different spaces. Well, so, I mean, they overlap, but they... Yeah, so, the OpenMV does some machine learning stuff now, but mainly it's OpenCV. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. How is machine learning different than uh, accelerated AI, Doug? It, okay, so in my, now, don't... Hey, Paul... Don't quote me as the expert, okay? But I'm going to say when I say machine learning, it's usually open MV type type uh, ac activity. So what does that mean? That means like, okay, I want to tell whether I've got 17 widgets on the assembly line. I want to know the color of the 17 widgets. I want to know which widget in the 17 widgets different from the other 17 widgets and it's a defect. That type of of activity, okay? So blob detection, uh, edge detection, face detection, uh, what's the other one? Uh, gesture movements, those are all open CV type activities. And they I would say they all fall into machine learning. Yeah. It, it, it Accelerated actually... AI is, I wanna find a cone because the shape of, of the cone is what I've been trained. Otherwise, I'm used a neural network to determine that this is a cone. Okay, so they're different, and uh, I mean, a lot of times the open CV approach is what you want. 
thank, thank you for that explanation, Doug. I am familiar with OpenCV. Uh, I've used it and I'm familiar with the kinds of things you can do with it. I wouldn't have called that machine learning, though, but may, maybe you do. May, no. um, I would have called it um, just OpenCV, but really um, uh, video or image processing. Yeah, mach machine learning is is in fact neural networks. Yeah, and, right. and my, what I'm what saying. we now call AI, right. um, which isn't really AI, but it's just right. you yeah, know it's something cool. that looks like AI. Yeah. Um, and, and and OpenCV, generally speaking, does classic computer vision algorithms yeah. like transform ho transforms and and you know different kinds of line detections and blob stuff and all that stuff that, that you're talking about those are open cv image processing stuff but machine learning is is definitely neural networks um thank you, that's, thank you john that's, yeah that was my understanding of the okay so i stand question. corrected on that but the, what uh, i'm saying is they're definitely different and yeah yeah, and yeah. Your yeah job, I, get, I get the difference yeah the job you got to do is is different yeah. Yeah, yeah, and open open MV cameras run open CV type okay. stuff. They do have some machine learning stuff in the latest stuff. I think you can run limited models on open MV now, um, but that's not what it's really intended for. Um, you know, if you want to run machine learning or AI stuff, then you know, get an OD or get a get a Jetson or you know something that's got i mean even even this little thing here is is that that's what it does it runs uh neural network to right. do object recognition is just on a really small cheap scale yeah. um and so. that's why i say accelerated because you're getting these boards yeah. like the one that john's saying where you know it really isn't you don't need a whole lot behind it because it's doing all of the heavy lifting yeah. You know, and you're only dealing with like, uh, like, like he said, the meta metadata. Yeah. And, you know, you don't. You otherwise you don't want it to. So and so, you know, the approach like uh, Bob Cook initially took was, you know, he did it with a. I want to say he used a. Uh, he, I think he used a Pi camera. I don't think he actually used a, uh, a yeah. webcam. I, I think he used a Pi camera, but all of his all of his computing was done on the Pi, and that's why he struggled with frame rate. Yeah, now, he, he was doing he was doing trying to do machine learning on a Pi, which is right. Which is yeah, bad. now he that he could have done that, and there are several solutions to that. And one of them is you know he could have just gotten an accelerator. Yeah, and that would have boosted him ten or eleven times. Yeah. So, you know, that might have been all you need. But, like, if you're doing something that only needs a couple of frames per second, which is probably not a robot, but, but you know, no. there's a lot of activity that that you can get away with this low frame rate. You know, you can just use a Pi and a webcam or yeah. or, or yeah. Regular, probably, probably want to use a Pi camera because it's a little faster, I think. Yeah, I'm I mean, not for, absolutely sure. For a robot, something like an oak makes way more sense because it can do, and they call it inferencing, which is basically doing model object detection lookup is called inferencing. And you can run inferencing at 30 frames a second on an oak D and basically just get the metadata back um, for what kinds of objects it recognizes and where they are in their bounding boxes and all that jazz. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, uh, a good example was that example I showed a few messages meetings back where I was using this dude here on and an old the program I used on my Robo Columbus thing, you know. Yeah. It was, you know, it's, it's cranking out 30 frames per second and uh, picking up cones. And so, I, I don't know. So, you know, if you were, I wish and sometimes that I didn't have a pile of shit, you know, and that I was starting over again. <laughs> if I was doing it all over again, you know, well, yeah. I'd probably get an open MV and probably would get an Oak D light. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying I would do such a thing, but, <laughs> but you know, I am a sledgehammer master, 
and we could uh, get you to start, get you to back to a place. I'll volunteer. <laughs> no, no I, I love my toys too much. <laughs> oh, you know, speaking of that, I've got my Hugo bot here, and I'm putting it together, and I got some extra parts, and I'm, I'm actually fairly happy with uh, some of yeah. the screw-in terminals for the TNT and stuff that I found for doing things. And uh, unfortunately, somebody on my Twitch stream the other night asked me how much, how much it would cost if they were to build this thing, and I'm like, why did you have to ask me that? Now I got to go add it up because you know when I buy parts, I'm buying at twenty and thirty dollars a pop, right? So just what I'm looking at here, I got the three hundred bucks real quick, and I'm like, you don't ask me to do math, please do not ask me to do that math ever again. <laughs> you know, just don't. Yeah, I kind of grabbed the screen there. What, Elijah, uh, what's your threshold there, Ray? It seems to be capturing all kinds of funky colored blobs. Yeah, these are actually, there's like, uh, I think, one, two, three, four, five different thresholds. And these were really set up for outdoors. So I think I'm getting a little bit of Donald Trump skin from the can. <laughs> uh, so it's not really separating you know, my hand out. Anyway, the... Um, the interface you can do, I think it's the, um, it supports SPY, I squared C, and Serial, and I'm just using Serial, and yeah. the only thing that I'm sending um, NESP32 is um, basically the, the, the centroid in the X direction of the blob divided by two so I could fit it in a byte. Um, because um, I was using, I think, quarter VGA, yeah, quarter VGA. Um, I think, what, it's 320 by 240, yeah. and 320. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So this is the, the program. Actually, um, the X centroid. And this you know, is OpenMV. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is OpenMVH. So. Yeah, and this is this is MicroPython that's running on the OpenMV. Right. To, to, oh, to wow. be clear. Yeah. So basically, it requires one line. Um, you, you know, you just have to look at the transmit out of the um, OpenMV. You don't even have to, you know, do anything with the receive side. Um, so three wires, power ground, and transmit out on uh, whatever UART pin you you decide to choose. I've, I think I'm using UART 3. Uh, yeah, UART 3. Well, oops, I jiggled my wire here. <laughs> and then your robot, robot programming, do you do that in Python also? Uh, no, it's in just in C oh, okay. um, on the ESP32. Oh, it used to be an Arduino Mega, but I think that that platform's pretty much yeah. not that useful anymore. I can only you know the motors are only going to spin so fast. Um, so I've I've gone to another platform and gonna I can use my. Uh, whip keep jiggling the USB oh. wire here. Well, I'm using uh, Raspberry Pi with uh, ROS connected using the serial port to the OpenMV. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, you can do... Uh, whoops. Get out of this. If you were to go into the maxi bit, it's... it's uh, Interface is very similar to that one. In fact, I think they copied it exactly. It's similar. the The code on um, you've got to make modifications. It's, you can't use like pull an example from OpenMV and use it in the. Well, you can. It's amazing how much you can pull over. But you're right. Yeah. Well, they can't pull over everything. Right. Yeah. So. so. But like I say, if I were starting over, and I would, I, David, I would tell you to go. If you want to go to OpenMV type 
type solutions, then I would say get an open MV. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go for a, a neural net type solution, then I would recommend the Oak D Light. Yeah, with fixed, light with takes fixed, a lot of power, but yeah. Yeah, well, it's not that much. Yeah, but it gets hot. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it just, I mean, I use an OD light with a Pi, and I'm using it on a two amp circuit, and it, it handled it fine. So, I mean, you know, it's. Yeah, the nice thing with the Oak D as well is you can, you know, the Oak D light does both depth and object detection and it can do both of those at 30 frames a second and you can export the data back over the serial link at at a rate where you can connect it to something like a raspberry pi zero you don't need a huge amount of horsepower on your exactly. as long as you're not sending frames back and you're just yeah. sending metadata back which and you can set it up um it, it's uh it's quite impressive yeah, and do and and the other thing about that that's uh, that's like you said you can you can literally get by with with a zero, and I didn't say zero two either. I said a zero. Yeah. You can actually get by with a zero on the backside. Um, though I probably wouldn't. I'd probably go a zero two yeah. just because hey, you know. Yeah, um, raw is because of. Uh because of historical reasons has a, a raspberry pi camera in the head it's this this thing right above my finger here you can't it's kind of black so you can't really see it you can see the wire the, the ribbon cable that goes up to the raspberry pi and i'm running a zero two um because i'm going to be running open cv on it which needs a certain amount of horsepower and a zero two is a quad core processor so the nice thing about the depth camera is the, uh, with the OD light is that if you're if you say are 30 feet from the cone and you see the cone, the camera the the model have no problem telling you hey, that's a cone. You know it looks like a cone. It is a cone. Mm -hmm. But when you're at say a f two feet, you know the whole screen is filled with with stuff but now you have your death camera telling you well you're two feet from your target so it 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 can allow a nice transition as you approach as you approach the object if the camera if the camera stops finding the cone because the cone now doesn't look like a cone you can now key on the depth de depth information and do it now you can also do it with an ultrasonic but but i'm saying yeah. if you have the depth camera it's there yeah uh, what i did with my uh robo magellan i've got an oak d light sitting up here and i've also got one of those little lidar you can see it here in the light there's a little lidar sensor inside this front bumper here mm -hmm. um and then one of the little time of flight uh guys so the idea is of course when you get within a couple feet of the cone then the lidar should detect it and then you can use that to approach um, right. and get a decent high resolution range value yeah. Yeah. and why would you do that instead of relying on the oak d lights uh, because the oak d light has a minimum range of about I think it's about 14 or 15 centimeters and it's it's unreliable any closer than that okay. um, so you uh it, they, they actually sent out an email either today or yesterday um saying that they've improved the calibration routines for them um and you can apparently run this new calibration routine on your old cameras and on, on your old OD lights and uh and, and it gives you much better results. But yeah, there's still a, a very kind of cast in stone minimum distance that you can't go under and yeah. get reliable results from it. Okay. Most, pe most people use some alternate sensor. Using a depth camera is, is kind of a newer thing and because yeah. uh, they weren't available except for big bucks until just recently. Now they're not depth cameras 
are in the range of being reasonably priced now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, for, for my outdoor rover, the depth camera is the only thing I'm using for navigating, like in terms of, of obstacle detection and avoidance and stuff like that. Mm. The little the little time of flight sensor is strictly for when I get within a couple of feet of the cone. Um, but all of the other obstacle stuff is going to be done with the DOP yeah. light. Because in a perfect, perfect Robo Columbus or Robo Magellan contest, you don't move the cone at all. You touch it, but you don't move it. So yeah. that that last few inches really is a finesse thing. And you say, well, I'll just let my bumper do it. Well, you have to make sure your bumper works real well. Yeah. And you don't want to be going full speed when you hit it. You want to be you want to be crawling when you hit it. But so that's cool. Want, if you wanted to use one of these cameras for indoor and outdoor, say for Columbus and for five can, you would still need to have a uh, close up distance sensor. Yeah, I had a, my, one of my. I used to the one the first very successful uh, six can robot that I ever made. Uh, actually, what it did was it would see the can, okay, using a blob detector. Uh, but it was probably the can might have been all the way across the the. Uh, the arena so i didn't really know how far it was because my ultrasonic couldn't catch it so i would drive using the blob detector until it's the my ultrasonic picked up an object in front of it in the same you know centered in the field and then i would just switch to the essentially i'd turn off the camera and switch to the to the uh ultrasonic and drive the last couple of feet okay and uh, in fact what I would do is I would actually I would capture the camera and I'd drive it until it found the the uh, ultrasonic found found it then I would stop the, the robot and literally do a fine tune on the angle and then go okay but, so you know that's kind of that approach is slow, slower. Yeah. But uh, you know, I if you look at uh, if you go back in the videos in the DPRG for I think one of the run videos of six cans several years ago, I literally had a camera mounted on the on the uh, on the uh, robot. And at the end of whatever the video is, I show that video of the camera run. That was just oh. sort of a little extra dealy. And you can see exactly how you can, it helps you see how the logic went. Okay. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think you could get a single camera that would work for both six can and Robo Columbus, that that would be tough. I mean, no, 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 that's not true, John. Scott's done it using a Pixie two, both. Yeah, of them. yeah, but that, that's that's good for six can. That's not really optimal for Robo Columbus. Well, I mean, I mean, it's okay. It, but... it works, you know. I mean, he's yeah. he he's been finding the finding the codes, you know. <laughs> That's not his problem, you know. Uh, Ray, you're, you're turned off, Ray. I, I use the OpenMV H7 for outdoors, but I, I put a polarizing filter on the front of it because it, you know, it's fairly sensitive. It doesn't need a lot of light to work, and bright, bright Texas sun was too much for it. So, and it worked okay. So. 
Yep. The OP light, it comes in fixed focus and autofocus. What's best? Yeah. Uh, for com- yeah, for computer for robots, fixed pro- pro- fixed. Yeah, if, if the if the camera's moving, then you want fixed focus. That's, that's their that's their recommendation. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll think the autofocus was a little too delicate for the. Yeah. For the rough outdoor world. Okay. Thank you all. I got some good notes. Well, anyone else got anything? Or are we winding down? Hey, Doug, I need to talk to you about renewing. I've tried. I never get emails, so... Um, I'm not certain what's going on, but maybe we can sit down and try to figure are, out. Are you getting the emails from me? I, I s- sent you one direct. Yeah, but when I tried to go and renew on the D- DPRG website, um, mm-hmm. it you know I can't remember my password, and it says, "Okay, well, we're going to send you a, an email." So okay, you can, I found a setting email. that was wrong, and I thought I fixed it. Uh, but I haven't had anybody verify it. So if you would try it again and just send me a notice and say, Doug, it's still a problem, okay. I would, that would really be useful because uh, yeah, I did friends. actually mm-hmm. find a setting that was supposed to be set set that wasn't set cool. on allowing users to set their reset their passwords. Uh, so, okay. so I thought I had it fixed. So, okay. But I haven't gotten anybody to actually verify it for me. Now, one well, thing you, you haven't changed it. I've tried it several times. So, in the last week? Oh no, not in the last week. But okay. Well, previous. Also, do another thing for me. Um, do another thing for me. Uh, make sure you clear your cache. Really? Okay. Just, just. I'm just because I just want to make sure that you're getting the updated page. Okay. 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 Right. I just want to find out because if if this setting was all it was, then we're we're good to go. If it okay. isn't, I got to keep looking. All right, I will try again. Okay, last call. Going once, going twice. Mm-hmm. Another fun evening, guys. Thank you, Carl, for and Doug for standing in, stepping in. And sorry, I wasn't there at the beginning, but I appreciate you, you guys' support, especially since you had a, such a rough, a rough ride back, Carl. All right. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the update from the uh, the lab. All right. All right. Yeah. Next week. Good night, guys. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.